Hi, this is John with WesleyGospel.com. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown did a really great um, uh, podcast. I guess that's what we're calling him now. Um, uh, yesterday on uh, what it, what do prophets look like, and um, I can really relate to that because when people talk about this in the low end sense, not in the high end sense. Um, I can kind of relate to it in terms of my uh, spirituality, my, my sense of my orientation towards Christianity. I can kind of relate to the characteristics that are oftentimes brought out in terms of personality, but in terms of interest, in terms of what I consider to be important. Um, and so, um, and it was really great because what he did is he, he referred to a book that I came in contact with about 20 years ago called, uh, it was called Prophetic Ministry by T. Austin Sparks. And in the beginning of it, there is an extract from a writing by Leonard Ravenhill called Picture of a Prophet. And in this, uh, you can clearly see that Leonard Ravenhill is looking at himself. <laughs> and, then, and then he's looking at the Bible. And then he's looking at people in church history and then writing out the attributes or character traits of a prophetically inclined person. Um, and, and so he, he has this list. And I'm going to go and read it. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this with my own take and then uh whew, ooh, I'm starting to feel something on me man ooh. oy vey <laughs> PTL PTL not to remember Jim Baker but just praise the Lord okay okay so here we go um Leonard Ravenhill said that prophets are characterized by the following one-liners he has no price tags I'm gonna make comments on this how about that he has no price tags why is that what do you think you're untouchables what do you think that's a great movie by the way if you can watch that with vid angel watch the untouchables the Kevin Costner movie what do you think you're untouchables what do you think you're untouchables yeah yeah, totally untouchable here. So you can take your money and shove it. <laughs> I'm not interested. God has given me work to do. I've got to do it, you know. Um, yeah, take your money and shove it, you know, is, is kind of like the first order of business here. Um, God has given me a vision. God has given me a dream. And it's not made up. It's not fabricated. It's not visualized. It was given to me. The prophet says, it was given to me. I have to discharge it. If it's great, if it's small, doesn't matter. I have to discharge my duty. The prophet has no price tags. He believes in a supernatural call of the Spirit of God, and he has to discharge that burden that weighs down on his spirit. And so he can't be bought. He can't be bribed by any ministry organization. He can't. He has to say what the Spirit of God says. He is beholden to no man. He has no price tags. My book, how to Experience God, which I will self-deprecate now, which is a low-budget e-book. <laughs> a low-budget e-book from a wandering scholar and man who spent a year of contemplative prayer in 2006 and had some pretty tremendous spiritual experiences. John Boroff, myself. It's called How to Experience God. You can go on Google... Uh, it's probably free and scraped by Google as a PDF. It's called How to Experience God. I've edited it like 20 times. Um, it's, it's still a work in progress, even though I finished my final edit around 2012. 
It's still a work in progress, and here's why. Because you're dealing with the experiential. Yeah, sure, you're dealing with what's biblical and historical, but you're dealing with the experiential. And so, you know, I will probably eventually want to do a final re-edit of that. And um, it's been my most downloaded book. I would like to say that the Gospel of Jesus Christ book that I did was the most downloaded. It's not. How to Experience God is the most downloaded one. And why is that? Because there's just a hunger out there. There is a spiritual hunger out there that is not being met by pastors. They're, they're, they're not allowing people, through their teaching, to experience the Spirit of God. And it's sad. It's really sad. There is a, a charismatic scholar lady in Australia. She was interviewed by the Remnant Radio Group. I forget her name. But she emailed me once and said that she had read it and that it influenced her and helped her. That's really cool to me. But the prophet, do I consider myself a prophet? Yeah. Do I consider myself on the level with prophet Isaiah? Absolutely not. Don't even say that. Are you trying to make me laugh? Um, no. Only in the first, only in the Ephesians 4.11 sense. You know, and only Pentecostals really understand this stuff. So why try to defend it to other people who don't even understand that or have that model, right? But yeah, sure, I consider myself a prophet. And, uh, and that's why I wrote a book that presumes the idea. And, and, I also, and I also believe that other people can become them too. It's, it's a matter of choice. It really is a matter of choice. Okay, prophet has no price tags. Why? Because this prophet experiences stuff from the Spirit of God, and he is beholden to no man. He is loyal only to what the Spirit of God tells him to do. And um, he's completely satisfied by that. When I finished my first manuscript back in 2009 on how to experience God, uh, I had it endorsed by a very well-known charismatic writer in the charismatic world at the time. He doesn't have a church, but he was, you know, like, oh, he would be interviewed on Sid Roth and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And I'm not going to say he's not a man of God, but he, he, he's, you know, and I'm not going to say I, I'm a perfect man either. But I had at the time a lot of this Frank Viola anti denomination type thinking, house church type thinking. And I had posted some stuff that was critical of pastors and how hypocritical they are and da-da-da-da-da and how I didn't like how unspiritual those pastors are. And that's I had posted an article about that. It's been put into private mode a long time ago, decades ago. But in any case, I haven't been on that for long. I've almost been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, so... Uh, so anyway, he was a Destiny Image writer. He had all this weight. I talked to Destiny Image. They were about to put it into print, but they had a couple conditions. The first condition was that I needed to travel around the world from church to church to church, representing Destiny Image representing my book, pushing my book, selling my book in churches, in church bookstores, and I have to plug my book everywhere. In fact, it was Destiny Image that told me to write this blog. They called it a platform, right? And 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 uh, so so anyway, I was like, oh, I don't like this. Doesn't the Bible say that you shouldn't make my father's house into a marketplace because it's supposed to be a house of prayer? And then he goes around bashing everybody's money tables. And here we are selling books in the church, selling books in church bookstores. I had I had some convictions against that. Yeah, 
I really felt like the Holy Spirit didn't want me to do that. Yeah. And I also felt like the Holy Spirit didn't call me to just travel around from church to church selling a book. And that was my calling in life. No. So it was that plus the combination of this writer who liked my book, who said I had a very cognitive approach. <laughs> As if that was an endorsement. A very cognitive approach to understanding spiritual life. And and then he sees my, my anti-institutional stuff, my Frank Viola type stuff. And then he says this. And I will never forget him saying this. This is a high profile guy. He wrote like five books on hearing the voice of God. Okay. He inspired Jim Gall. He inspired all kinds of people. He was on Sid Roth. All, I mean, he was a big name. At least 10 years ago, he was a really big name. Okay. He was a somebody. He was going to make me a star. He was going to make me a star. I was going to get... I was going to get on Sid Roth. I was going to get in the charisma magazines. I was going to get in the bookstores. I was going to be a charismatic somebody. Now listen to this. He sees my article where I'm criticizing the hypocrisies and the Matthew 23 elements of hypocritical pastors and unspiritual carnal pastors in the churches that never talk about the spiritual life, and they know better, and they still don't. And he says, you remove this or there's no way you're, quote, getting in on this. There's no way you're getting in on this. I was like, what in the world is that? Getting in on this? That's investment talk. I was like, no, that's all right. Um, you know, I just kind of changed my mind. I feel like the Lord wants me to go in a different direction. <laughs> the Lord, you, you know, you start off with something like, all right, step one. All right, step one. You listen to like 300 sermons from Leonard Ravenhill. Step two, you have a bunch of spiritual experiences. Step three, you develop a phenomenal prayer life and you become totally otherworldly. Step four, you start to write this stuff out because it makes you feel better. And you also think that maybe other people might be blessed by it as well. Step five, you start contacting Destiny Image and this is what you get. Travel around the world plugging your book. Don't criticize pastors because there's no way you're getting in on this. Oh my gosh. Getting in on this? Are you kidding me? That's how you view the spiritual life? That's how you view teaching people about spirituality? Getting in on this? Now, don't, before you think that I'm just picking at words or being nitpicky about expressions, it's a mentality. It's a mentality that says, we're going to go to charismatic conferences and charge $300 a head to hear the voice of God. Right? It's the idea I'm criticizing here, not just the one-liner of getting in on this. It's the idea of marketing that which is spiritual. The Simon the Sorcerer paying for the Holy Ghost marketing that which is spiritual in a marketing spirit. Part of me doesn't even want to sell my ebooks for five bucks a pop, but I thought maybe people would download these things for five bucks a pop and it would help me to maintain WesleyGospel.com costs a little bit. Guess what? Nobody has paid a dollar <laughs> since I started monetizing these books. No one has paid a dollar. <laughs> because, well, mainly it's because the PDFs are all over Google. Um,. And it's also because I haven't thrown any money into promotional activity on this site yet. But, you know, if it can help me to promote the site more through, you know, online marketing, if it can help me to travel every once in a while to preach the gospel, I'm all for it. If it can cover missionary costs, I'm all for it. I don't have a problem with that. But, uh, but the prophet has no price tags on his body. That's the thing. 
He has no. He can't be bought. He's untouchable. Don't ever watch the movie The Untouchables without VidAngel or ClearPlay. It's too profane. But it's a really great movie if you can. What do you guys think? You're untouchables? What do you think? Yeah, we do. <laughs> Why are we untouchable? Because the Holy Spirit gives us a mission and we're conscience bound to obey the Holy Spirit. I would rather obey God than men. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. The prophet has no price tags. All right? He's not going to push a book to get in on this to become a charismatic superstar on Sid Roth. Right? If I'm ever going to get on a show like Sid Roth someday, I'm going to do it the right way. And I'm not going to make a bunch of bribery compromises along the way. You know, Because that's not, that's not the call of God for a prophet. A prophet has an experience of God and he has to do what the Spirit of God tells him to do. Not what people and their little charismatic Simon the Sorcerer business methods tell him to do. Okay. That's the first thing I wanted to say that. Amen, Brother Ravenhill. Okay. He is totally otherworldly, Ravenhill said that about prophets. They're otherworldly. In other words, they're more spiritually minded than of earthly good. People will say, you're so spiritually minded, you're of no earthly good. Yeah, that's a prophet. They're so spiritually minded, they're of, they're of no earthly good. They need people to help them with their earthly things because they're always thinking about the spiritual life. They can barely pull themselves out of it. Yeah, totally agree with that. Uh, Ravenhill said this about prophets. He is unquestionably controversial and unpardonably hostile. Uh, I agree a little bit with that. But, you know, you don't want to be so controversial and hostile that you're not, you don't even have 1 Corinthians 13 love in you. Um, and you even, you, I mean, you're not like a mean-spirited person necessarily, but you're going to see times in dream, vision, or observation in real life where, especially in the church, where righteous indignation will fill you and you will give verbal expression of that righteous indignation about sins and hypocrisies that are going on in the church. Things that could be fixed if people would just simply change their attitude, but you know that they won't, and it just makes you angry as can be. And there's nothing wrong with that right? It's zeal. It's righteous indignation. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not like a continuous thing because righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit should be the general characteristic. It's just that there's going to be these spurts where you have to express it or you'll go crazy. He marches to another drummer. What does that mean? It's kind of a colloquial expression people use. It means that he goes, he's counterculture. Prophets are counterculture. They're, they, they're, they're especially counterculture uh, to the church culture. Like they, they can see past it, and they're not going to just overlook it. Like They see, see things all over the place in churches, and they're not just going to overlook it and compromise it. They're going to speak out against it, and, and I don't care if you hate me because the Holy Spirit wants me to say this. He marches to another drummer. Who's the other drummer? It's the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ravenhill said that prophets breathe the rarefied air of inspiration. Okay. That's dreams and visions. I don't think that Ravenhill talked about dreams and visions much, but I think that he had them. I really do. Um, I think that he was just very, uh, very reserved about it. I think he had dreams, but I do not think that he had visions. Uh, one time in one of his sermons, he says, when does that vision come? And he cried. He broke as if he never even seen him. Right. And he used to criticize the Kansas City prophets like John Paul Jackson because, because he would, he, almost as if he was jealous that they were having visions and he wasn't. And he would say to John Paul Jackson, well, that helps them, but that doesn't help me, right? 
It's because he hasn't been taught. When you're coming from a holiness background, you're not taught to have visions. Right? It's a soteriology spirituality. Right? But I still think that he must have had dreams. I, I really do. Because this is the next thing he said. That a prophet is a seer who comes to lead the blind. Now he puts seer in quotations as if he didn't have dreams and visions. It's hard for me to believe that he never had dreams. It's, it's, it's hard for me to believe that. He lives in the heights of God and comes into the valley with a thus saith the Lord. Okay. In other words, he has spiritual experiences of the Holy Spirit. Then he comes into the valley. What is that? The valley is the depressing, uh, the depressing aspects of human experience that he can relate to with the burden-bearing experience and then speak to that that other people are experiencing. Have a spiritual experience in order to uplift people in depressing moments and experiences. Yeah. And, and in order to do that, he has to experience a bit of it himself. Uh, Ravenhill said that prophets share some of the foreknowledge of God and so is aware of impending judgment. Well, you see, he must have had dreams because here he is talking about prophets having foreknowledge, right? I think he was just reserved about it and he probably didn't want to upset Bethany House Publishers, who was his main publishing outlet, because they were not like hyper charismatic, from what I know. I mean, they, they published Encounter with God by Morton Kelsey. From what I understand, that's a really charismatic book, but that was not his. That was, charismatic experiences was not Raven Hill's forte and or it wasn't his uh, brand <laughs> that he had built for himself. And when you're an author, you kind of build a brand in some cases. But here he's, he's talking about contemporary Christians devout having some of the foreknowledge of future events. Huh. Well, he must have had dreams then. If he didn't have visions with his eyes open, he must have had dreams then. He must have. Prophets live in splendid isolation. Isolation? Splendid? Isolation. Well, what's that? Separation from the world. Right? You don't, you don't have a bunch of friends like everybody else because those friendships are usually just carnal. Right? So prophets need to be clean before the Lord and in so doing oftentimes find themselves isolated from friends like John the Baptist in the wilderness, like John in the cell in Revelation 1. God sees to it that they don't become carnal by being surrounded by a worldly bunch of people. They become desert fathers or such like. They become isolated from the world because God wants to keep them pure because the pure in heart shall see God. And if you want to see God in dream or vision, you, know, you have to be pure of heart. In order to be pure of heart, you oftentimes have to separate yourself from the carnal. Splendid? How is that splendid? Because you get to see God. That's what makes it splendid. Um... Uh, Prophets are forthright and outright, but he claims no birthright. What is that? Forthright. Forthright. Forthright means honest, transparent. They got nothing to hide. They're honest and they're transparent. Outright. They're bold. They're outspoken. And they don't, they're, I mean, they're like, kind of like a little kid in a way. Like, little kids just blurt stuff out all the time, you know? They don't hold their tongue. They just blurt stuff out. And they don't care if it's embarrassing or not, right? The pure in heart shall see God, become like a little children, believe, trust, the miracle experiences, and just blurt stuff out. That's fine. Just go ahead and just blurt stuff out. Prophets are like that. Like, they have no sense of political correctness or, or, or a sense of political, you know, tactfulness. They just blurt stuff out. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying they don't have self-control, but what I'm saying is that sometimes their, their hearts will get so full of ethical concerns from the Holy Spirit, they just blur stuff out. He claims no birthright. What is that? No entitlement. 
No sense of entitlement. I've been in churches before where the pastors were like, Oh, my grandfather was a Methodist bishop, and I descend from a great line of preachers. Man, what kind of talk is that? Where's the Spirit of God in your life? That's what a prophet's like. Where's the Spirit of God in your life, right? Uh, Ravenhill said, His message is, Repent and be reconciled to God, or else... Turn away from sin or you're going to hell. Turn or burn. Prophecies are parried. His prophecies are parried. Okay, what's that word? <laughs> parried means warded off, counter moved with a sword, uh, questioned and accused evasively, dodged. In other words, people just kind of ignore it. Right. Now, when we say prophecies, we don't, we don't mean just future events. We mean anything that's a message from the Holy Spirit through the guy. Through dream, vision, voice, or impression, or burden. Yeah. That's, not, that's my experience, not your experience. Oh, you know, well, that's your interpretation, not my interpretation. Expect that. If you're called into the prophetic by the Holy Spirit. Expect that kind of stuff. That's my interpretation, not your interpretation. You know, people dismissing the holiness preacher in order to excuse their carnality. Uh, Raymond Hill said that prophets, uh, their truth brings torment, but his voice is never void. Brings torment. He's going to preach about hell and the torments of hell. He's going to preach about sin and the guilt of sin. And it's tormenting to listen to it for a carnally minded person who's distracted by earthly concerns and cares. But there's nothing shallow about anything that he's saying. Prophets are considered as the villain of today and the hero of tomorrow. They're oftentimes not given any sense of glory in the church world during their lives. But later on, they build the sepulchers of the prophets. Later on, they honor him, them as great men. Oh, yeah, great book. Great, yeah, okay. Uh, prophets prophets uh, are excommunicated while alive and exalted when dead, right? In other words, nobody wants to be around that guy. He keeps on telling us to w stop cussing and looking at porn all the time and, and, and watching rated R movies with our buddies. You know, why do we... Pff, he's just legalistic and judgmental. And of course, when he dies, they, they all buy his books and they're like, wow, what a, what a man of God. And they build the sepulchers of the prophets even though their fathers killed them. Prophets dis are dishonored, <clears throat> they are dishonored with epithets when breathing and honored with epitaphs when dead. In other words, they're insulted, they're called legalistic judgmental when they're alive, but when they're dead, they're honored in these, these great men. They might even build a statue to them. Prophets are schoolmasters to bring us to Christ, but few make the grade in his class. In other words, prophets, prophets are, are like driven, just driven by the Holy Spirit into Bible and theology. And, and, and as a result of that, they, they, uh, they, they will stop at nothing to bring people to Jesus. So oftentimes they're called evangelists, and oftentimes they are. But there's also this prophetic edge and this gifting, and this calling, and this spiritual experience underneath it all. But few make the grade. Why? Because they're all cheap, grace-oriented pastors. That's why they, make, they, 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 they adhere to teachings that are false. They keep on because of all of their carnal, cheap grace friends. Prophets are friendless while living in famous when dead. Here it is again. They get isolated because they're so committed to biblical ethics while everyone else wants to cut corners. Prophets are against the establishment in ministry 
and then he is established as a saint by posterity. It's not that they're anti-establishment for the sake of being rebellious. It's that the establishment is filled with cheap grace people that don't want to change their ways. And so by matter of course, he does not become put into a pulpit or give a, given a microphone. Oftentimes he, he is, he is going to speak what the word of God says and call them to account and warn them for their sinfulness and be aggravated by their carnality. And then when he dies, everybody's going to buy his books and say, yeah, what a great man of God. Frustrating. He says, Prophets eat daily the bread of affliction while they minister, but he feeds the bread of life to those who listen. Yeah. So that means that everything that comes out of his mouth during his life in ministry, more or less, is going to be spirituality related in content. And it's going to actually help people to get closer to God. Unfortunately, because there's so much carnality within the ministry, he will be deprecated behind his back or to his face, laughed at and mocked at. Prophets walk before men for days, but have walked before God for years. In other words, the whole thing with the prophets is his personal spiritual life with God. Every once in a while, he has little spurts of glory and revival breaks out. Why? Because all he's doing is sharing little crumb snatches of his spiritual experience with God with other people, and other people catch the vision for a while, and a revival breaks out. He walks before men for days, but has walked before God for years. His priorities are right. Unlike the carnal ministry boys everywhere where their priorities are totally the other way, right? They're all about man-pleasing, not about God-pleasing. Prophets are a scourge to the nation before he is scourged by the nation. Scourged to the nation before he is scourged by the nation. Yeah. Yeah. See, the scourge has to come out to get rid of the money tables in the temple because it's supposed to be a place of spirituality and prayer. So here he comes with the whip to scourge all these businessmen in the the place of prayer he scourges now this stuff about the nation well take it with a grain of salt there's major prophets and then there's minor prophets you know but to anybody who listens to him he, his voices are scourging and then people who don't like him will scourge him with their words and their cheap grace rebuttals Prophets announce, pronounce, and denounce. Okay. Announce means, hey, hey, listen. Listen to this. Pronounce means, this is going to happen. Denounce means, that's a sin. Right? I really like this one. He says, prophets, he has, he has a heart like a volcano, and his words are as fire. I like that. I like sometimes... When Runner Ravenhill talks about having a volcano in your heart. I love that. Yeah. Because it's coming out of your experience of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, that, and that sounds like the Aldous Gate experience as well. The flame of love. Um, he talks to men about God. Plain and simple. Plain and simple, prophets are like that. They have such a relationship with God that they just talk to people about God. They just talk about God. It's, it, they don't think twice about it. They're not religious. They just love the Lord. They just love the Spirit of God. That's it. They just talk about God. Right? There's, they don't have an outward formality. They've had real spiritual experience, and they just want to talk about God because God's real to them. He talks to men about God. It's just that simple. God's real, so... I'm going to talk about him. Prophets are like that. They don't even think twice about that. It's a natural side effect of your relationship with God. Um, well, let me qualify that. It's a natural side effect to your relationship with a real God who you know to be real because of your experience of the Spirit of God. Um, 
I think the problem with most people is they just they're not they're not certain that God is real. But here they are in the limelight with a microphone in hand every Sunday. Totally vain. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity, saith the preachers, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes 1 2. Or is it 11 2? Yeah, no, Ecclesiastes 1 2. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. Uh, Raven Hill says, the, the prophet carries the lamp of truth amongst heretics while he is lampooned by men. He carries the lamp of truth amongst heretics while he is lampooned by men. In other words, he has to go to, he has to, go to churches where everybody's into antinomianism, and he has to preach against antinomianism, tell people to obey the God, word of God, because their interpretations about the cross are totally heretical, and then he will be lampooned by them. He will be made fun of, satirically mocked, as a legalistic, judgmental, arrogant man who misinterprets scripture, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, okay, whatever. The prophet faces God before he faces men, but he is self-effacing. Yeah. Faces God. God is real to him. God is real to him. This is not in question. God is real. And in his prayer life, he faces the presence of the Lord, the real presence, because God is real. This is not a questionable thing. This is not even, this is, it is out of the question. It is out of the question that God might not be real. That thought is out of the question for a prophet. Completely out of the question, right? He knows God is real. The Spirit of God is real. He knows the Spirit of God. And in his prayer life, he faces the Spirit of God before he ever steps in the pulpit or gets in front of a microphone. But he is self-effacing. He is self-effacing. There's self-deprecation involved. I am a rotten sinner saved by the grace of God. If it were not for the blood bath of the cross, I would be nothing. I am nothing but for the bloodbath of Jesus Christ. The prophet hides with God in the secret place, but he has nothing to hide in the marketplace. He hides with God in the secret place, that's his prayer life, but he has nothing to hide in the marketplace. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. I, I don't know. What does he mean? He has nothing to hide in the marketplace. He's not he's not a lying, cheating, thieving scoundrel. Yeah, that's probably what that means. The prophets are naturally sensitive, but supernaturally spiritual. Naturally sensitive, but supernaturally spiritual. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're not callous. They're not hardened by the business world. They're not they're not what you would call Men that have consciences seared as with the hard iron, right? They have sensi emotional sensitivity. Why? Because they have to be sensitive to the subtle movements of the Spirit of God. If they didn't have emotional sensitivity, there's no way they could ever pick up on the perceptions and the wavelengths of the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, they, they have to be sensitive. There's a sensitivity there. They can't be like these hyper, you know, <laughs> hyper muscular action heroes that are just like animals. You look at them and you think to yourself, like, does that guy even have a heart, right? Prophets aren't like that. <laughs> We're not like that. They're sensitive guys. Um, and I'm not going to say that prophets are girly men. I, I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to say that. You, you think about Elijah and Elisha and you think to yourself, man, those guys are just girly. No. <laughs> no. But neither do you look at them and think to yourself, uh, those guys are like Arnold Schwarzenegger and like they have no emotional sensitivity. You know, you don't, you don't think, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not mean to pick on Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm, I'm talking about his image is what he represents. Okay. What I'm saying is that the prophets are neither girly nor bodybuilders. They're 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 in the middle. They're in the middle. They 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 
they have a sensitivity about them. Yeah. Prophets have passion, purpose, and pugnacity. Passion, purpose, and pugnacity. And this, of course, is all propelled by the Holy Spirit, their experience of the Holy Spirit, awakening their conscience about what is right and wrong. And that's where it's coming from. And so they're passionate to save people from hell. They have purpose to save people from hell. They have pugnacity, a willingness to fight with cheap grace antinomian preachers who don't really care about saving people from hell, but just want to take advantage of people, control people, and take their money. And it really ticks them off. They have a pugnacity about that. Um, prophets are ordained of God, but disdained by men. Ordained of God, but disdained by men. In other words, they're going to adhere to the priesthood of all believers. Ooh, I felt the Holy Spirit burning in my belly just now when I said that. Thank you, Lord. Hot Holy Spirit burning in my belly when I said that. Prophets are ordained of God but disdained by men. In other words, you don't need an Assemblies of God certification preaching license to be a prophet. Far, far from it. Far from it. You don't need it. Right? You have the Spirit of God ordaining you through spiritual experience. Work with it. Run with it. Write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Write down the substance of the dream. But you will be disdained by men. Why? Because they're a bunch of porno watchers. End of, end of discussion. That's what it boils down to. They're a bunch of porno watchers. Pastors and, pastors, uh, and priests and, and, and uh, a laity alike, they're just all porno watchers. They don't want to live holy. And here you come. Yeah, but you're still ordained of God, and so that's all that matters. Then uh, Ravenhill talks about this. He says this about prophets. He, he, he has a bunch of lets. Let's. Let him be as plain as John the Baptist. Let him for a season be a voice crying in the wilderness of modern theology in stagnant churchianity. churchianity. Let him be as selfless as Paul the Apostle. Let him to say and live this one thing I do. Let him reject ecclesiastical favors. Let him be self-abasing, non-self-seeking, non-self-projecting, non-self-righteous, non-self-glorying, non-self-promoting. Let him say nothing that will draw men to himself, but only that which will move men to God. Let him come daily from the throne room of a holy God, the place where he has received the order of the day. Let him under God unstop the ears of the millions who are deaf through the clatter of shekels milked from this hour of materialistic mesmer mesmerism. Material mesmerism. He's talking about false, false pastors who are just after your money, and he's saying these guys are spiritually deaf, and so let's unstop their ears. Preach against prosperity gospel and prosperity preachers. Yes, do that. Let him cry with a voice this century has not heard because he has seen a vision no man in this century has seen. Okay, so he did see visions. Maybe he, he's talking about that metaphorically, or maybe he's talking about that supernaturally. I don't know, but he at least was familiar with the idea, right? God send us this Moses to lead us from the wilderness of crass materialism where the rattlesnakes of lust bite us and where enlightened men, totally blind spiritually, lead us to an ever-nearing Armageddon. God have mercy. Send us prophets. And that's how he ends it. So, be Wesleyan. Be ethical. Preach against crass materialism. Preach against prosperity preachers. And be ticked off about it. Because that ticked offness is from the Holy Spirit. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.